In March, Chemical in the Americas 2025 is looking forward to welcoming authorities and industry experts in Boston to share hands-on experiences and the latest news related to global chemical control regulations and sustainability. I'm currently at TURI, Massachusetts Toxic Use Reduction Institute. TURI is an inspiration for authorities around the world. Their innovative approaches help companies, especially SMEs, to substitute hazardous chemicals with safer alternatives. What is Turi's secret recipe? I will ask Bashkut Tunchak, the director of Turi. Bashkut, what are some of the key lessons learned from Turi's ongoing journey to take toxic use reduction to the next level? Well, thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, gosh, our, our journey has been kind of a long one. We've been around for 35 years as of this year, uh, and we've learned a lot in those years. And I think the first, first thing that comes to mind is that safer alternatives exist. And where they don't exist, they can be developed. And I think our experience has shown that time and time again. Um, when we look at specific instances like the use of particular chemicals uh, more broadly, we see that you know, industry is actually open to and willing to adopt safer alternatives. For example, TCE or trichloroethylene. Here in Massachusetts, it was the result of some childhood cancers uh, that happened in the the 70s and 80s. Uh, since then, thanks in large part to the Tura program, companies in Massachusetts have been able to reduce their use of TCE dramatically to the point that we're hoping that in the coming years they will, there will be zero reportable uses in Massachusetts of TCE. Okay, that's impressive. Can you show and share how Turi organizes collaboration and innovation? Well, I, I tend to think of Turi as organized around something like a R&D pipeline, if you were to take the analogy. So at the very front end, we have our policy program. Our science to policy program works to keep the Tura legislation up to date. Um, we look at the science, how the science is emerging. We propose uh, with the collaboration of the Science Advisory Board to list additional substances under Tura. Um, and, and that really starts the the process on which we, we do a lot of our research. Uh, we work with academic researchers to identify prospects for new alternatives, safer alternatives. Uh, our lab program then takes uh, promising alternatives and fine tunes those to the needs of businesses in Massachusetts. Uh, they also do performance testing to demonstrate that a particular art alternative can work and meet the performance needs of a business. We have a, a training and implementation program as well. And this is really important, not only for us to be able to amplify the individual case studies, success stories that we may have, uh, but also to work more directly with businesses through a, a small army or a cohort, cohort of what we call toxic use reduction planners. These are basically substitution experts that go directly to companies to work with them. And uh, that really gives us the ability to help translate those individual case studies and success stories into a broader impact throughout Massachusetts and beyond. So those toxic substitution experts are part of the TURI team or are they an external uh, group? Yeah, they're external to TURI. Uh, TURI is actually a relatively small organization, uh, but those planners help us to amplify our impact. Uh, they may be in-house in a company dedicated to working just with that one company or business, okay. or they may be consultants, you know, working for a, a handful of different um, clients, companies uh, on not just implementation of Tura and developing the TUR plans that companies are required to do here in Massachusetts, but a whole range of other environmental health and safety issues as well. And so once a certain substance is identified, then the planners will be sent to the industry that is using that substance, or how does that work? Actually, well, the, the companies are required to report on their use above a certain threshold um, uh, for all of the substances that are listed under the tour legislation, which is tiered based on higher hazard uh, substances and those that are just hazard subs hazardous substances. Um, and so companies, need to report on those chemicals in the list, irrespective um, of what other obligations they may have. 
Uh, so if a chemical is added to that list, then they will have reporting obligations. It may be an entirely new thing for a company if they didn't use any of the other chemicals before that chemical was listed, or it could just be another substance on which they have to develop a toxics use reduction plan as part of their overall planning process. Okay, so the reporting is not a, not a ta paper tiger, it's really effective, and if you're new to it, then you get one of the planners. It can be, and I think our history has shown that over 35 years. Okay, now it sounds a very uh, promising way of uh, working together. Um, this, I mean, TURI provides technical assistance. Um, is there also financial assistance? Are there incentives either from the Massachusetts government or elsewhere? Yep, absolutely. And, and really our technical assistance and financial assistance go hand in hand. But speaking specifically about the financial assistance, TURI provides small grants. Uh, you know, in the vicinity of say twenty-five to thirty-five thousand uh, dollars to academic researchers, to businesses, and then also to community organizations, and all of those different categories are instrumental in trying to get safer alternatives developed and then implemented in practice. Okay, so it's a targeted f uh, fund to help substitution of uh, hazardous chemicals. Absolutely. So, for example, a, a business could get a grant to procure a particular piece of equipment that would be necessary for a safer alternative. An academic researcher could get a grant to do some, some preliminary research, and that grant actually serves as seed funding uh, to then jumpstart a larger research program for that researcher. Okay. Hey, you already mentioned communities. Um, how is the relationship here in Massachusetts between environmental justice and toxics? So that's, that's a good question. We have a report coming out uh, very soon looking at the intersection of environmental justice and toxics use and release here in Massachusetts. Um, using the data that's generated under TURA, we are able to take a very um, precise look at what toxics may be affecting communities around the state and better define what, um, what interventions we can provide, what support we can provide to help ensure that safer alternatives are there, uh, helping to ensure the competitiveness of the businesses uh, as well as protecting the health of those communities. Okay. Hey, on Sustainable Wednesday at ChemCon the Americas 2025, we will have a great session on technological developments supporting sustainability mm -hmm. implementations. What do you consider are relevant technological developments and tools for, to use? Well, we have uh, developed a, a handful of different tools that I think are useful. One of them is the Tura Data database that I mentioned, which is a tool that people can use to understand what are the toxic threats in their communities, um, but more around the tools that businesses can use or researchers can use. Uh, one, of what, one of the tools that comes to mind is Cleaner Solutions. Okay. And that is a database of thousands of different examples of alternatives that have been tried and tested uh, to serve as alternatives to toxic substances. Um, that's the first one that comes to mind. The second one is something that we call P2 Oasis, which stands for the Pollution Prevention Options Analysis System. Okay, and nice name. I didn't have anything to do with the name. But uh, P2 Oasis is basically a tool that anyone can use, literally anyone can use, to compare the hazards of a particular chemical and a, a possible alternative. So you don't need to be a toxicologist or a PhD scientist in order to use this tool. It's also publicly available. You don't need to pay an expensive uh, subscription to be able to use it. So we, we really are trying to get these tools out there. And, and, and this P2 Oasis, does that provide real alternatives or are some of the suggested alternatives like Fata Morgana's no, not realistic uh, substitutes? So that's where Cleaner Solutions uh, plays a role. So Cleaner Solutions looks at more of the viability of alternatives, whereas P2 Oasis is more about comparing the potential hazards of different alternatives. Okay, mm -hmm. good to know. Yep. Hey, data is always key when we talk about technological developments. Can you tell us a little bit more about data reporting under Tura? Uh, companies are required to report on their use and release 
of those toxics that are listed under the uh, Toxics Use Reduction Act. Um, and so, for example, recently we listed a very, very broad class of PFAS under TURA. And over the past few months, we've been receiving uh, new data on the use and release of PFAS in Massachusetts. Um, and all of that data is compiled in a database, uh, and we do that in collaboration with the Department of Environmental Protection here in Massachusetts, MassDEP. Uh, and it's all publicly available on that touradata.org uh, website that I mentioned, okay. where you can, you can search by you know, your jurisdiction, your, your municipality, uh, you can search by the chemical of concern, you can, you can search by a whole number of different factors to see exactly what's happening with respect to the use and release of toxics. Okay. It's really a unique feature. It goes above and beyond what um, any other state or jurisdiction has at this moment. Is there an option for industry to mark part of the data they provide as confidential? There, there is a level of confidentiality that is provided, and that is largely around the, uh, the plans, actually. So the toxics use reduction plans um, are not publicly available. Uh, so that, that is one of the, the measures of confidentiality that's provided to businesses, both in terms of uh, disclosing how the chemicals are being used in their processes, as well as what the potential alternatives are that they're identifying or looking at. Okay. If we talk about alternatives, eh, can you mm -hmm. share an interesting case study, perhaps, for one of the Tosca priority chemicals? Um, sure. Yeah, so I, I mentioned TCE earlier. I think uh, TCE, trichloroethylene, is a great example of a priority chemical. Uh, that Turi has a lot of experience working on, and we actually have many case studies that look at it and look at the potential for alternatives and success stories in terms of substituting out TCE with safer alternatives. Now, what I think those case studies show is that it's not a matter of finding like one, one case study, one, as my colleague Jason would say, a, a silver bullet that will replace it. It's not that simple. It's often thinking about outside the box, looking at a broad suite of different possible solutions, redesigning, being creative. And, and that's where I think the, the, the more interesting case study is, is looking at what is actually required in order to move away uh, from one of these widely used priority chemicals. Another example, more recent example that I would give is uh, our work on PFAS and finding alternatives for PFAS. In the case of electronics, we were able to find an alternative for PFAS that was used as a surfactant. Great. Um, we, we entered into a collaboration with a Massachusetts manufacturer of a formulation that was used by electronics companies and an academic researcher here at UMass Lowell. In less than two years, uh, for just a few tens of thousands of dollars, uh, this team was able to create and, and uh, deploy a safer alternative to PFAS that's that was being used as a surfactant in the production of electronics. Um, it was adopted by over 90%, I think over 95% of the businesses that were a customer of this Massachusetts business, and uh, these are some of the biggest names in electronics today. And they didn't lower the product requirements, it was really an alternative without being a regrettable substitution? Absolutely. It was, it was safer across the board. It also met the performance requirements, which is why it was adopted by so many businesses. Uh, and it was also 90% less expensive to manufacture for the company here in Massachusetts, meaning that they were more competitive um, overall. So a great example of joint forces replacing something which is not only uh, an innovation, but even cheaper to implement. Absolutely. Incredible. In Europe, uh, similar toxic use reduction uh, developments and substitution initiatives um, are ongoing. What can we in Europe learn from Turing and what are some of the valuable lessons, both the do's and the don'ts? Hmm. Interesting. So I think in terms of Dues, one of the most uh, important things, at least for me, is really to work with the communities where the toxics are being used. Meet them where they are. Meet the businesses where they're at. Meet the communities where, they, where they're at. 
and really focus on the most vulnerable members of those communities uh, to find the solutions that they need, that they're looking for. Um, in terms of the don'ts, um, I think one of the, the benefits that we have seen in, in Massachusetts and the U.S. more broadly uh, of the EU's approach to toxic chemicals, yep. the progress that the European Union has been able to do under REACH and other regulations and directives over the years is that we've been able to overcome a lot of the hurdles uh, that businesses face in terms of adopting safer alternatives uh, because of that regulatory push. Uh, I think one of the big don'ts would be, you know, don't, don't use this opportunity for substitution and, and building out substitution centers to slow down that approach or to undermine that approach. I think that approach has uh, incredible global impact and, and influence and it's really tremendously valuable. Baskut, thanks for your insightful journey. Looking forward to continuing this journey with you and the ChemCon family during ChemCon the Americas 2025 in March in Boston.